When we think about the village and how the whole center of that village were our children, were the young ones. They are our speckum. They are our flower. We get to see all kinds of flowers, from the trees to the ground, from the dandelion to the daisy, and coming together who we are. The reason why we're looking at creating a land-based sort of Halkaminam immersed middle school is I really believe that this generation of kids are the first generation to really understand um, what has been lost and what we're trying to um, breathe life back into. I would like to acknowledge that we're gathered here, that we're gathered here at this beautiful place, at this beautiful place. And then the other point of it is with climate change and all the challenges that this generation is going to face, which my generation and the generations before me just didn't take seriously at all. They're going to have to have an imagination of, of restoration and, and uh, flexibility and change because we can't keep going on the way we are. Even locally, you know, the impact of logging and fishing and just we're hearing from elders the impact you know, the cedars are dying and why is that? And so again, I think that's a, that is something that is a bias in our program that we're saying those two things, truth and reconciliation and climate change are legitimate, actual lived challenges that these, that these kids will face. And we're not doing them any favors if we just keep motoring along as though they, they aren't gonna face those things. That's kind of the heart of, of why we're doing it this way. The school itself was conceived of and encouraged by uh, Denise Augustine, who's now in, with the Ministry of Education, with Indigenous Education. As Mill Bay School grows from a primary school, essentially, to a place that honors older learners, the way we support our learners needs to change. So this project is an invitation to the educators and administrators and families to figure out how to do that. How do we keep those pieces of honoring Halkaminam ways of knowing and being that are connected to this land, this place, and at the same time honor the learning needs of the children as they get older and their sophistication in what they need uh, develops. We are encouraged to take chances and make mistakes and get messy here by Robin Gray, who is our superintendent. The work that Mill Bay uh, Nature School has done has been incredible uh, in term, terms of starting a new way of educating our, our learners in our community. That has been um, a challenge. Uh, great rewards and building community that um, most people don't get to try to do in their lifetime in, in the world of education. And I always want to be alongside to support that their work that they're doing. And I know that um, it will have great success because of the fact that they, the community that they have, working together and collaborating together and and leaning in and taking risks and being innovative and using some of the research and using some of their friends across the province. 
it's going to be pretty profound. And taking up Indigenous ways of, of being and an Indigenous viewpoint in our close association with Deb and Tusilam as elders and residents here. We wanted to have a, a name for, for the school. And so I talked to my elders and what do you think about if we use Kashinto? And they all nodded their head, yeah. With that name, it means we're walking together. So in every aspect of life, to, to look after Mother Nature, to look after little Johnny or little Susie, or be respectful to our teachers. And so it just goes and moves in, in its circle and what it means. The old people would say to not so much on up. So they say work with one mind, one heart. And that's happening here in Crescento. They're making that a reality. They're making that real and they're making it happen. And so not just you and I can do it, but all of us coming together, we can do it together. Let's Crescento, let's walk together. And then there are some professors from universities who work specifically with this age of students, so middle years, kids, and they're very interested in different structures and rhythms beyond maybe the more colonial structures that we're used to. Uh, so that's Leighton Schnellert, who's a professor at UBC. One of my research areas is uh, middle years pedagogy. I lead the program at UBC. Um, but as we started to live it, we moved away from let's put middle years pedagogy into the middle years program and say and come to realize how are we living it because it really has been the more that the students and the teachers in the middle years were connected to the place and to the elders and knowledge keepers the more the questions they wanted to address became clearer and the ideas that they had for taking action and so we began to live middle years pedagogy, not by trying to implement it, but by noticing what was happening. And I'm gonna use the, 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 the garden metaphor, watering the sprouts that were happening. And so things grew because it's an emergent curriculum that comes from the place. The place is the teacher, the land is the teacher and the elders and the college and people are not separate from the land. And so the learning was happening together in, 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 in really kind of collaborative ways. But in terms of moving forward, we've really just scratched the surface. Decolonization and digitization doesn't happen because we said we're going to do it. It's a practice that happens over time as we figure out what's next because it truly is collaborative, emergent, and needs to be respectful. And Paige Fisher, who's a professor at VIU. There's also Graham Giles, who's a professor at York University who um, works a lot in Indigenous education. And we have many parents who are interested in this, in this challenge, in this opportunity for their children. Um, Jemima Monroe is one of them. And then the kids have a really strong voice in the composition of this, as well as um, Brian, the brave Smukla clan teacher. I've met a lot of teachers that think teaching is about them, and it's not. The colonial structure supports that. I am, I have the knowledge, I will give it to you. You will do what I say, return it, and I'll tell you if you know it or not. Where when you change your perspective and you put the students truly in the center of what you do, the curriculum doesn't become, a, it's not a checklist anymore. It's a living thing that each individual in that group can change and alter and find their own way through. But one of the keys is, and it's something we're wrestling with this year, uh, to Selim called it, he referred to uh, a tree we have in our back field that I call Lonely Gary. It's a Gary oak that's just sitting there surrounded by an orange fence. And he was talking about the orange fence, how it was like the adults. If Gary, Lonely Gary was the children, the orange fence is a fence of adults and how it would be his aunts and uncles and he didn't know which ones were actually his aunts and uncles and his moms and dads, but that could have been anybody, uh, all there just helping to move the, the future of their village forward. And so that's actually a tricky thing right now with one class, it's just one adult and Kim when she can. So sometimes it feels like 
we're not giving them that, that, that surrounding of safety and knowledge that we can. And that's something that we're thinking of for next year, is how do we increase access to this, this group of adults that are there to keep them at the center, but offer enough of a support network that we can do that in, in a kind of effective way. Burgoyne Bay started as just another one of our adventures. We've heard Zealem talk about it. So here we are, Burgoyne Bay, a place that we hope to visit time and again for your whole time here at Mill Bay as Smukwa and whatever we become. Um, I know you are super excited and I hope by the end of the day you remain super excited because this is going to be a tough one. Uh, it's going to be tough because I hope you feel a connection to this place in the end. The connection, beginning to understand the connection that Devon to Selim must feel to this land. And we're also going to do a lot of hard work. There's a really big mountain. You can see the top of it. That's way up there. We're going there. So that is Mount Maxwell. And we're going there for two reasons. One, because it's a mountain we get to climb and there's a sense of right to climbing a mountain, but also because it's going to give us a view back on the Cowichan Valley, back on the lands of the Hulkamina people that we can't see from Maple Mountain. You can't see from Mount Zuhalem because you're not high enough and you're not far enough away from it. Because the whole goal from January now until June is my goal is that you have a deep understanding of the Cowichan Valley and the lands of the Hulkamina people. And then we went and it was shockingly dirty. Um, surprisingly, at that point, we'd been on a ton of adventures and seen city parks and provincial parks and crown land and nothing had been left in the state that this place was in. And it really struck the whole class as something they, I don't know if they wanted at first, they knew they wanted to do something about it, but just something that didn't sit right with them. And then we went back and we had an opportunity to work with Tusilam's family who live on Salt Spring and work really closely with Kwakwam and all the visitors there and, and are really powerful advocates for that area becoming not so controlled by the provincial parks and controlled by the people that have lived there for thousands of years. I think working um, with the Stikia Learning Society, um, especially on the beach cleanups, um, there's been a lot to learn um, about what being a land steward means and in my opinion like who better to learn from than the indigenous peoples of this land because we've had a relationship with the land for over 12,000 years and especially working with the youth I think the youth are you know the core of our society they're you know they are the future so uh, for for the youth to come and step forward and say like I'm gonna pioneer this work I just think that's amazing and I think it's the best possible way forward. But they taught us a lot that day about the how the history of how it got to be that way, um, the various states the park's been in, how we should be on the land because that, that's been a giant learning curve for us the whole time and so they they led us through some activities, they gloriously fed us which is for a 10 year old an amazing thing and then we spent a big chunk of time cleaning up the beach and we filled up a pickup truck and a half within an hour, and we didn't even make a dent on what was there. Like there was trash everywhere. It was like people have moved into Kwakwam. And although it's a provincial park, it's not treated as a provincial park, but I think the kids immediately saw it as, oh sure, all these other provincial parks we went to aren't dirty, are cleaned up. And of course it's Tusilam's territory, a Kawichan man, who it's left dirty. It was a huge eye-opener to them about what the whole concern around Indigenous land claims and unceded territory and, and maybe an experience of thinking that that is sacred territory and then how it's being treated, which is kind of what's happened in North America generally, right? So they got an experience 
Although Brian and I didn't set it up thinking that would happen, that, that is what happened. And that is definitely decolonizing practice, right? When you sort of allow things to be and don't have an already set you know, agenda for what's going to happen or what they're going to learn. They left signs, they were disgusted, they wanted to clean it all up, they were sad. So we loaded up from there, went home, and weeks later, things still didn't sit quite right, and we ended up returning to the idea of a protest. When I asked them, when I said, teachers are wanting to get rid of this garbage, what do you think? They're like, oh, we need to protest. Like, there was no discussion about it. It was like, no, no, we need to protest. We need to go to the legislature. This is not okay. We need to do something about it. And I think Brian and I both, I've been to protests, but I've never initiated a protest. So Brian and I were both nervous about it. I bet you could see how the kids were so, like this is, yeah, they had a fire. So we ended up uh, organizing and protesting down on the steps of the legislature building in Victoria. We met Sonia Firstino, who's representative for Cowichan, and she came and spoke to us and then introduced us in session. She was, as the voice of the opposition, she was speaking at the beginning and introduced us as these, this group of kids that were out there for a purpose, which was just a really powerful experience for the kids. It was a taste that, you know, they can say something and people will listen. And these kids are here today to raise awareness about uh, the impacts to Burgoyne Bay from pollution, uh, from uh, garbage being left behind, from oil and diesel spills in the water. And we, we went home um, feeling good, not knowing whether we had really done anything, but, but that we had taken the step to express our thoughts um, and, and made it clear that, you know, what was happening wasn't, wasn't right. And they were all looking for themselves on the news, which a couple have made it. And yeah, all in all, it was really exciting. And then uh, it just kind of faded off and we just kind of didn't know what to do next. And since then, we've actually heard that they're making changes at, at Kwakwam. Uh, they're starting to remove the derelict houseboats, um, different ministries beyond uh, BC Parks that manages the area, like the Ministry of Natural Resources now is involved and they're looking at all these houseboats that are pumping raw sewage straight into the bay and are asking them to leave. It's really powerful to think that maybe our voice made a difference in talking to Deb. Right? She said no one's referenced us, but all this stuff started happening since Smakwa took this up this year. And to know that maybe just the voices of some really committed 10 and 11 year olds were just enough to tip things over and make a change, um, you can see it in their eyes when we talk about it, that they're really excited and, and that's such a powerful lesson for them that just because they're young doesn't mean people aren't going to listen, especially when they're thoughtful and intelligent and, and not kind of just being aggressive, right? Like really clearly sharing their message. One of the amazing, um, unexpected, beautiful things that happened as a result of our trips to Kwakwam, the kids' reaction to the pollution, negative attitudes towards that sacred space, they're taking up the protest. All of that seemed to hold within it commitment, love, respect. So what I'm learning about, I don't know if it's what you'd call it, decolonizing or indigenous, I don't know what you call it. What I'm learning is that in Halkaminam culture, elders are watching to see what you do. So they, Deb and Salem and other knowledge keepers gave us teachings and watched to see what we did. They gave us um, feedback about that, told us where we were making mistakes. It was all done in a gentle way, uh, but clear. We've come a really long way um, from when we started and we have a really long way to go yet. And in terms of, you know, we always say, it takes the time it takes. It's, uh, it's really hard to tell um, the funders though. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is gonna take a while longer than what we thought it might. So yeah, Nana, how do you explain that to a funder? L looking for some kind of a milestone that you've, that you've reached. And uh, I think we've, we've reached a ton of milestones, but 
I don't think we're anywhere close to where we need to be yet. Um, and I so appreciate that our youth sit in these circles with us. I, I'm always fascinated by how easily they understand this stuff. And it's the adults that I sort of feel like we run into a brick wall with sometimes. And, um, and I really appreciate all the adults that are trying to climb over the brick wall. Um, and I feel like we're getting close to the top. We just need to do that last little bit and then over, and then we're on the other side. But I've been really thrilled with the work that we've all done together. Um, and I think we still got tons of work to do, but we're in for the long haul. Um, and I really appreciate parents that have been a part of this too, because I know that's not the always the easiest thing to do. And I really appreciate a parent's voice in all of this. We've recreated the village though. That feels really, really powerful. Um, and I think when we get back to that idea that uh, our schools are our villages um, and that we're re responsible for one another um, and that we look out for one another, I think we get back to uh, really grounded education. So we have to respond to what we're being being taught, not just in our head, in how we're enacting, like living our lives. And what happened as a result of that is Deb and Tusilam and the Kwakwam Foundation are like, okay, so you're the kids who are gonna start sleeping over there and you're going to start a program there for other kids because we trust you, because you've shown us this commitment and this love. And it's not just the Smukwas, it's Brian, it's me, it's our parent community who also supported the students on those trips. And so that's an offshoot that we weren't, when we said, let's build a Hulkamina embedded land-based middle school, those are kind of just words. Uh, and it seems to me that's what we're now playing with, right? Is playing with, so what would that look like? And one day they just asked me in the summer, so how often are you gonna come? And in my head, it's back to the finance, the financing part. Okay, so we can't just go there. Like we'd have to pay something. So what does that mean? And, and they're not asking us, right? They're not saying we expect, you know, this is a traditional like camp would say, this is how much it is per kid and this, right? It was all laid out. That's not the way a land-based hall communum, right? Embedded school is going to look. And so what does it mean to decolonize finances? I'm back to that. And I said wholeheartedly, yes, like for four days, you know, every month for a whole week, Monday to Thursday. But in how do we figure out how to reciprocate will be interesting. Um, and there is no answer to that. And so I'm wondering about that and, but not allowing that to be what guides us you know, instead being the invitation, right? To be invited by elders to come to a sacred place and learn there and be taught there is just amazing opportunity and fruit. I think fruit from all the work that the kids did and their commitment level. And that is decolonizing. Cause again, we're not striving for one thing. We're living in good ways and then seeing what happens. And uh, it's magic. And so when I see our Christians all come together and I see our students all come together, that leaves me a lot of hope for those tomorrows. And that's the belief I'm sticking with today, is that hope and dream for those tomorrows.